Good morning, everyone. Uh, my partner, Scott Boutour, will be here shortly. Uh, this is the presentation for uh, Where is All My Disk Space? Uh, I came to be known as a bit of a Macintosh guy, and Scott will be here to cover uh, whatever questions you might have for your Windows uh, machines, which I don't know really very much anything about, so I will need his help. Um, if uh, there are any of you who are into open source or Linux, probably you don't need me talking at you uh, because you're, you're probably way more independent than I am of, uh, of, uh, of those sort of issues. But if you do, uh, here's Adam and he'll be able to help you with that too. And uh, that's Christy. Okay, uh, Scott will be with us shortly. He's just uh, getting to get his stuff together with a new computer. I have thought of this from the very beginning. <coughs> There's Scott. I have thought of this from the very beginning as being more of a round table. We're gonna field questions. We're gonna help each other. Uh, there might be things that even you can suggest to each other that Scott and I haven't thought of, uh, which is fine with me because I honestly have not prepared anything because I don't know what to say. There's a lot of stuff that I take for granted uh, that um, I don't know. I, I no longer know how to approach from a beginner standpoint. And I, I sometimes call that expertosis. Uh, when you know your stuff really well, you stop looking at it from the viewpoint of a beginner and you the stuff that you assume is the stuff that the beginners need to know so we're going to make this so that then the questions you ask scott the questions that you ask me are totally from your viewpoint but um scott would you like to give a quick self introduction self quick hello to everyone sure i'm uh, i'm uh, middle-aged and i've been working with computers all my life i owned my own computer store back in canada and uh so figured this might you know, be the type of uh, discussion that maybe I could be helpful. The people who started up the whole conversation, let's see, uh, Gretchen, uh, Cassie is not here yet, but um, maybe we can start uh, by fielding the most immediate questions that actually spurred this whole comment thread on OTJ and then spurred Scott to say, hey, maybe I can do something. And I said, hey, Scott, let me help you do something. So why don't we start with Gretchen because she was one of the first people that actually um, came up with, the, uh, with those questions. Sounds good. Yeah. Hey. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm laughing because for me in my lovely brain, I need to know the process of why you put things where, um, like where are you put, how are you compartmentalizing things? What are you saving? What are you keeping available? What's okay to throw away? Like just, just your mental process and then the physical actual, what are you doing? That's what I need to know. And it's not intuitive to me. Totally. Okay, understand. Jose, you wanna go for that? Um, yeah, I think so because I'm pretty sure Gretchen works on a Mac, right? Yes. Okay. Can I write so, that my name, maybe? <coughs> uh, I remember, but Scott might need to know, and it wouldn't hurt uh, so that we do know what your primary computer is. Um, okay. But a lot of the stuff, I'm going to try to make it so that a lot of my answers actually apply to most people. So first, Gretchen, um, where you put your stuff, how you organize, is there any particular sort of um, problem that you have with any particular sort of application, uh, the way that you use that application? You can never find that application's files or anything like that. I've, okay, this is a problem. I've spent money um, expanding my cloud, expanding my drive, expanding my Dropbox, and I have no idea where the things are or even if I need all of these things. <laughs> can you solve uh, that? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> but I, I can maybe give you a hand. Okay, <clears throat> first of all, just a few things, and this, is, this, this applies to everyone. Okay, um, I got a bunch of hints I wrote down. Oh, there it is. Bunch of hints wrote down somewhere because this is stuff that I've noticed over time, especially during the pandemic when I hear from people around these, these issues. Some people use their, their applications and their cloud in a way that obscures where those files are because they don't show up as files in the finder. I think Scott might be talking about this a little bit in terms of like uh, the, the volume or the size of the photo, <clears throat> the photo library, things like that. I'm going, he's gonna be talking about that stuff, but I think for everyone, I think because of the way it can be so tempting to do it because you get so much email with attachments and stuff. 
that people use email as a type of file folder system. If you get, a, you get an email from Adam, you go, oh, that's an email from Adam. Oh, good, there's that attachment. Okay, I'll just leave that there and come to it later. And later, if it's five minutes later or five days later, depending on your aged brain like mine, is very easy to forget where it was. And those attachments start to pile up in certain places. So if you want to get to know your computer well, you have to be more disciplined with understanding that if there is a file and you want to keep it, you should keep it in a place that, that is more reminiscent of a, 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 a file folder branch. So for example, come on cursor. I hope I'm not oversharing anything that I'm gonna be embarrassed about later. This is actually my folder structure inside my computer. Now, <clears throat> in a Macintosh, there's a sidebar. Do you often see this when you open up your folder, Gretchen, the sidebar? When you open up finder window in the computer where it says things like uh, your desktop, your airdrop, the name of your hard disk, your personal user folder. You sometimes see that? You don't see that at all? You're, you're muted. You don't need to talk directly to me, but okay. I, um, yeah, I didn't even like use a finder. <laughs> okay. How do I oh. use a finder? Like, I, I mean, there's just simple things that I just, Okay. I don't know. So, yeah. Okay. So, talk to me. I will. I got will. it. Okay. So, what I'll do then instead, I know that for some people on smaller screen computers, it's going to be harder, but I'll try to limit the amount of time that I spend sharing the entire desktop. Oops, there's a little bit of private information there. Um, the finder is this guy on the left hand side on the Macintosh. The finder is an old, old name for the primary software that holds all of the files on the Mac OS from before it was called the Mac OS when it was called the system, when it was called system five and system six. The finder is now an unintuitive name for what this thing actually does. It basically is the file hierarchy system. I mean, if you've ever used DOS on uh, Microsoft, this is where the DOS tree came, you know, DOS, C drive, and then documents. And Scott might be more familiar with that, but this is how your files are organized within the computer. Now, if you call up the finder, you're going to get windows that look like this. Now, depending on how you have this upper, uh, um, upper uh, tab bar, organized. You can get these folders and, and um, locations on your computer to appear either as a list, okay? Uh -huh. And actually the list view is different. That's the list view there where you can see more um, information like when was the last time this was modified, what kind of item it is, if it's a folder, if it's a PDF file, if it's an MP4, or you can get them as icons. And some people are more visual and they like to go to icons. And if you double click an icon, you'll see the arrangement of the music folder. I, my system defaults to what's called column view. So every time I open up a new window, it defaults back to that. But if you've ever used the old system, you double click that folder, it'll show you the contents of the folder as again, a bunch of icons. My favorite way to view this stuff is as columns. And the reason why is that, for example, if I clicked um, Jose, okay, now let's make that columns. Okay, and then I go to documents and then I go to say uh, OTJ and then I go to summer sessions, I can still see my folder hierarchy. And I can see that if you, if you sort of visualize this 90 degrees, okay, you turn it clockwise 90 degrees, you can see that documents branches out into more, which then branches out into more. And it, in my mind, the way that my mind works, I can, because I made all of these folders inside documents, I know that to me, what's important is uh, my, uh, my disk for, um, uh, uh, okay, Amy is the name of my old uh, disk, and I'm still moving stuff from my old disk to, to new locations. But here's where I have my Dropbox, my OneDrive, my Google Drive, aliases. When, when Dave and I are working on the podcast and stuff like that, that was important then. Uh, general, which is, I know some people don't even like the idea of a general folder because it's very easy to throw too much stuff in there, but I generally tend to keep my general folder clean. 
stuff from my website, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in OTJ, uh, I do that by OTJ Moodle, by OTJ TV. Uh, when we did the t-shirt uh, uh, design contest and stuff, these are all the folders that I have. And I make these um, just by either going to the finder menu, make a new folder and then put stuff in it. That I think is the most important thing that people can start doing. Go to your main, um, and hang on a second. I think I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to mute everyone uh, because uh, <clears throat> just hearing a bit of background noise. And uh, let's see, let's go back here. I, uh, I, I create these folders so that then I know where stuff is. And at first you don't have to make all of them, make them one at a time. Like for example, you go to documents and say, okay, here's work, here's life. And this is work. And then you put all that stuff from work and then from life. Oh, here's, here's a, um, uh, I don't know, uh, a PDF that I got from mo mom and dad uh, that shows me the new baby pictures of my sister back home. That's fine. And those two splits right there are enough and you can start putting stuff in it. Once you've got a lot of stuff inside work, you'll notice that there is stuff that's organized by, or that you can generally see a pattern that the stuff falls into two categories, one for that university, the other one for that university. And you go, oh, okay, let's split that into the two universities. Then you start organizing that. And if you've never done this, this will take time. This will take a commitment of time to get organized. It's like cleaning your room. It's like cleaning your house, uh, cleaning your attic. It's, it's gross. Uh, you get bogged down in memories. And go, oh my God, I can't believe I still have those photographs. So you have to be a bit disciplined with yourself put a little bit of effort into it, but you do two folders first. You look inside the one folder once it starts to build up and you look for the pattern as to what more folders you can use to organize it. You look inside life and you notice that, um, you know, there's some photographs there that you haven't put into your photograph, uh, sorry, your photos app or whatever you use for your photos app. And it'll make you think, hey, then maybe that's something I can more deeply organize as well too. I suggest starting to adopt a file folder hierarchy. I've been using this since I first started using Windows computers all the way back in, gosh, I'm 87. Adopted it to, um, to, uh, to Macintosh and have never abandoned it because it keeps me organized. But where your stuff is, um, probably, first of all, if you don't know how the Finder works, you're gonna, if you don't know how the Finder works, you're gonna, I would suggest, look down in the Finder Okay, call up a finder window. The sidebar by default comes up on the left hand side. And depending on how much you played with it or what you may have mistakenly pushed, okay, you would actually literally have to show me that finder window so I can tell you, no, that's not where that should be. And that's how you access that. And that's how you make it appear. Basically, there's the finder. Use the finder to create organization in your. In your may I interrupt for a minute? Um, um, if it's a if, quick one, if it's a quick one, Linda. If the sidebar doesn't show up, you can go up into view and pull down and it says hide or show sidebar. Yeah, there you go. Okay. You also have to learn that, you know, um, you don't have to remember everything. The, one of the great things about uh, modern interfaces is that if you learn how to use the menus and you look at them, you don't, you don't go to them only when you need them. And then in the, in a, in, when you're only searching for things and you ignore everything else in there, when you've got a calm moment, look up at those at those menus and tell yourself, "Oh, that's that's an interesting command. Let me see what that does." Um, Scott, what do you want to add from a Windows perspective in that sense about uh, general hierarchy and organization? You're muted, sir. Okay, so let's let's start from a top level view. When you go to the computer store to buy yourself a computer, very likely the price point that you may be looking at will provide you with not enough storage space. And that's where the money comes in, because if you would like to have more storage space, then you pay more in addition to the, the baseline price that you're looking at when you go to, whether that's the Denki or, or Apple. So to give you an example, I just got myself a laptop this week from Apple, and I chose to get the two terabyte solid state drive inside of mine because it is the maximum space that I can you know, possibly get. And the reason being, I'm gonna hold on to my computer for five to seven years, and I have a large photo library and a lot of music. So for me, it was the wisest choice to just try and get it all inside my computer, not to buy a computer with too small of an internal memory 
and then have to get an external hard drive to back things up all the time. Um, but, you know, that difference in price was quite a bit. Like I paid six extra mon to get that two terabyte hard drive, whereas the one that normally you'd buy just stock off the, the shelf would have probably been 256 or, or 512. Um, so you kind of have to think about, okay, so the computer that I've bought, did I pay extra to put internal storage into it? Um, maybe not. And if so, you know, for instance, if you've got a small hard drive, then you have to think about what other solutions can I have to extend the life of my computer? You know, do I have a backup hard drive? Do I have uh, a big uh, flash drive? I'll give an example. Like here's one that, it, you know, we see these all the time, but this one is a 128 gigabyte. Right, so this is as big as a hard drive and many other computers, not the 16 gigabyte you may have floating around your office. And so try to get things that you that are beyond what you need so that when you really are in a pinch and you have to move something over that's big, you've got extra space to do that. Um, so I think the first thing is you have to assemble the pieces that you need and think about, okay, do I need to keep <laughs> an entire year's worth of my Zoom recordings or, <laughs> Potentially, maybe only I need two months of it and I can trash the other, you know, 10 months of it and just keep the last two months. Or do I really need to document those so that, you know, the faculty or, you know, whoever is that's looking over my shoulder wants to see them? And if so, then then what you need to do is take them off of your internal hard drive on your computer and put them onto, you know, something like this so that you never have to see them again and you know where to find them if you need them. Um, but so I think, first of all, you have to think about how much space do I actually have? Okay, the next step is, if my hard drive is too small, then what cloud services do I need to, you know, tide me over? You know, and that's where, for instance, if you're an Apple user, maybe you've already got an iCloud account, which I think, Gretchen, you mentioned. Um, or, you know, Dropbox is, a, is another alternative. And the great thing about Dropbox, it works on everything. You know, it works on Windows, it works on Mac, it works on uh, probably your Android device, you know, so you can, um, once you save it into Dropbox, that's the advantage of Dropbox or even iCloud, you can then access it from all of your devices, not just on the computer. And so saving things into the cloud becomes really convenient. Like even if you're not, you don't even have your computer with you. If you're at work or you're at a friend's house and you want to go to dropbox.com, you can then open up your account, show them the file, and there it is. You know, So uh, I think that the big picture is you have to think about what, what do I already have as far as like, you know, what services am I already being, am I using? Am I, am I running out of space because I don't use any of these services? Am I running out of space because I'm constantly recording Zoom recordings, which I didn't think I did, or maybe when I set it up, I didn't realize what I was doing. Or is this just daily stuff? You know, is it because I'm collecting too much music or, or I've got a whole lot of photos because I take a lot of pictures? But what I can say for sure, your computer is not getting too full because you're using too many Word documents. I can say that with 100% certainty. Your Word documents will never jam up your hard drive. It isn't the Word document that's doing this. So, so don't, don't get so micro concerned about the smallest of emails or the Word documents because that is not the problem. It absolutely could be a video file or uh, a lot of pictures that you're being taken, you know, or a lot of albums maybe that you have in a, in a surprisingly large music library, uh, because those are the things that occupy the, the largest amount of space and they're 100% certain as to why those would be the problem. Um, just a couple of points that came up in chat <clears throat> before we get to like uh, questions and comments about uh, I said and what Scott said. I, I don't even want to say all due respect because like that makes it sound that puts it in a different category of things. But um, you're going to start getting all kinds of, when you ask this question, Gretchen or anybody else, hey, where's all my hard disk space? You're going to get all kinds of approaches from all kinds of different people, uh, especially people who have found success because they found success in their particular path. So for example, Scott's um, uh, advice about uh, get the biggest internal hard disk you get, I did the same thing. Okay. But I also knew that it was, there was a reason why I did it. And I, and I knew that I wanted to spend the extra money. Eric's advice, which is that, um, yes, Apple's memory is extortionately expensive. Okay. Now that if your first priority is to save money, okay, then that is a very valid reason. But when, when somebody like me, or when somebody like Scott tell you that we wanted to get the biggest internal disc, 
there are reasons that you should probably remember that if you know if you don't completely understand them, um, maybe it's that's what you should explore. If your your first priority is saving money, okay, then yeah, you there are other things to consider, but uh, that's where you have to balance out what you want to do, what you can do, and then to save money, then you have to start. Um, uh, you ha you need the actual knowledge of your computer so that then you can start doing things like hooking up external drives, and then you have to know how to take care of them. Uh, so, if you want the easiest solution get a big internal disk it also ends up being the most expensive solution but it also ends up being for most cases the fastest solution now uh, that being said i live in the best of both worlds i have a, a two terabyte internal disk an nvme um, just blazingly fast solid state disk and i have at the same time a 32 terabyte terabyte uh, you know, a 32 terabyte hard disk array underneath my desk. So uh, that is as fast as my NVMe because it's, it's the way the disks work. When you listen to advice, uh, remember that this particular expert, this guy who really knows his stuff well, has his own way of doing things, does not validate what the other guy is saying, but the other guy is saying it for different reasons. So Eric has very good reasons why he said, don't buy that memory from Apple. But Scott and I might be saying, well, no, that's actually really, really valid for, uh, for, for different reasons. Okay, so before we start getting too deep into, uh, into techie stuff, um, comments, and just even comments, uh, like uh, Linda's comment about, hey, you know, the, um, the sidebar is here, because see, there's my expertosis. I forgot that most people don't have that side, or I think it's actually defaulted, but it might not be on, right? It's not? Okay, did you remember where I'm, uh, Linda, can you give your advice one more time? Linda, queen of tech. Sure. Um, the sidebar um, should be on the left. If it isn't, if you're in the finder window, go up to the top menu bar and you see finder, file, edit, view. And if you click on view and look down, you will see in the third group of stuff, hide sidebar or view sidebar. Good advice. Yep. See, and the two experts are going, hey, that's a great idea. <laughs> Gretchen? Gretchen, you're, you're muted. Again. <laughs> Can I just show you my finder and what okay. I- Okay, you know what? I'm gonna give everybody screen sharing because I think, I think a lot of people are gonna wanna share stuff. So go ahead, Gretchen. Sorry, I don't know what. Uh, my finder is this. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's your finder. Sure, sure. Yeah, but I don't, like under my favorites, okay. I don't have all the things you have, Jose. I'll Click have on favorites. Click on it. Click yeah, on it. there's yeah. a little. You see that arrow, arrow there? There. Oh! Oh! <laughs> there you go. It's one of those moments. Uh, that's uh, that was like that moment when I showed Susan how to like uh, adjust uh, the cameras in Zoom, uh, I, and I'm glad I recorded this one. I recorded uh, Susan's one too. I'm gonna do a montage of those. Oh, here's a joy. <laughs> okay, I'll shut up now. Go ahead. But okay, um, Gretchen, Gretchen, share that share that window one more time, and I'll I'll show people um how you can start thinking a little bit more. Uh, in a way that will help you. I'll share that window one more time. You have to think about the fact that Apple made this OS and, and, and uh, Microsoft thinks the same way too. <laughs> She's having a great time. Um, so that they can give you some visual cues, standard visual cues that will help you understand that you have options. Now, for example, Gretchen, put your cursor over that word, that grayed out word favorites one more time. Now, do you see that arrow come up? It's pointing down. That means that it's actually extended down. Now, if you extend it to the right, that means that you know, you've, you've collapsed the menu. Now you've, you've expanded the menu. You can see everything there, right? And probably under, uh, well, actually, let's take a look at your locations. You see locations as the third category, favorites, iCloud locations. Yeah. Okay, so there's only one location, and then that's um, your one computer on the network, okay? Those um, tags, you can, for example, right there with coaching with Megan, you, um, if you, uh, are you on a trackpad? Are you on a, on a mouse, Gretchen? You're probably on a trackpad, eh? Trackpad, okay. So any one of those, um, let's see, uh, um, let's see, this is archive utility. 
Well, I'm trying to look for a folder or a file here that you can tap. Okay, good. Go into documents, see that folder, it says documents. This is on iCloud, but it's okay, it's the same. Do you have anything in there? Okay, so again, you should probably start thinking about your, your file uh, organization by using that one. But uh, let's say downloads in uh, iCloud. Anything there? It's not there. Okay, uh, hang on, Linda. Okay, so there you go. Now, just for example, just for example, that uh, that one that says uh, uh, there's an un uh, I don't want you to open anything that might be kind of weird, but uh, probably that 2020 TESOL alum jolt there. Just click on that, and then okay, um, either two finger tap or however you do the right click. Okay, now do you see those tags, those color tags there? You can choose a red one, you can choose a purple one, okay? All of the ones that you choose as red will now show under the tags menu on the sidebar. Anything that you tagged as red will go in, okay, well, I'm, I'm just showing you as an option that a lot of people will use color as a way to organize stuff. I use folder hierarchies to organize stuff and there's all kinds of choices to that sort of thing. But look for those visual cues. Uh, that especially that collapsing and expanding arrow that's used as a visual cue in a lot of places. It's actually used in Zoom too. If you look in the Zoom um, meeting toolbar, you'll see down below that there's an up arrow right next to the um, to the microphone icon, which then gives you uh, an upward pointing or an upward popping pop up menu for your for your microphone and audio options. It's a pretty standard um, OS uh, uh, visual cue now. Okay, but an important point, if I could add. When we're looking at that file hierarchy, something that can save you some real time. If you could share that screen one more time. <laughs> Good, Gretchen, you're still muted. There we go. Good work. Now, if you could go to any of these folders on the left side and right click. Desktop is fine. Yep, desktop documents, downloads, any of these on the left side in the the reason I don't want to do this is because I don't know where my stuff is and I don't want to show you anything. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I just, I just want you to right click on the folder because it's not going to necessarily reveal anything. Right. Oh, see, so if you, you, you clicked, you didn't right click. There you go. That's okay. Yeah. Right click is the, yeah. Whatever. This is fine. Yeah. No. If yeah. you right click on that and then hit get info, that'll tell you how large that folder is, like how much space is that using. So now, just give it a second here. Yeah, what it's doing right now is literally calculating the size of that folder. And there are a lot of little files in it. it it's got to look at each file and calculate and do all of that. So if it, it don't let it freak you out. It's just calculating it, calculating it for the first time. So we're just waiting. And there's a lot of stuff in there because it contains the music folder, the iTunes folder, the garage band folder, and all of that stuff. A lot of smaller files in there, maybe. It's, uh, voice memos. I have a lot yeah, of okay. voice memos. Mm -hmm. If you got a lot of voice memos, that'll yeah. that'll take up space and it has to calculate each and every one of those. Well, well and when you stop. when you get that number, then you'll be able to say to yourself, how large is my hard drive and how much of it is being occupied by my music? That would be a big one. And so anything visual like a PowerPoint or music. Hmm is large, much larger than a document. That's what we're saying. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Now, you're, yeah. you're don't, now, one thing to keep in mind, when you do presentations, when you use Keynote or use PowerPoint, mm -hmm. a lot of times you put into it music and photos and sometimes yeah. videos. So sometimes yeah. those Keynote and those PowerPoint files can become huge, really, really huge. big. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But aside from that, typically your PDFs and your Word files and your Excel okay. files, nothing. All right, thanks. Sure, welcome. Okay. There's now. another thing you can do in the finder window. Um, under view, you can hide or show your status bar. And the status bar is a, along the bottom and it shows you how much space is available and how many items are in each folder. Okay, do you see right. that status bar down there? Yep, got okay. it. And that will, if you move to a different folder, Okay, it will tell you. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, it does. I'm looking. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. 
So from that sort of high level analysis, if you go through some of the other folders, like your photos folder, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to say words that we, we use both on Windows and on Mac. So it, it, it could be photos or pictures, depending on which operating system you're using. But if you right click on those folders, even in Windows, you're still going to get the same information instead of going to uh, get info, you're going to go to properties. And then it's going to give you the same information about how big is this folder, how many things are inside of it. And once you've determined which is the folder on my on my hard drive that has the most stuff in it, then you know exactly where to focus your time so that you can then make the biggest difference and how to clear up some hard drive space. Another thing about the a finder view, you see several different things hide or show and just click on each one of those and see what it is and decide whether or not you want to hide it or show it. And you have other different view options and click on that and just decide what you want to how you want to set your computer. Good. Uh, anybody else with uh, something they'd like to, to bring up as a topic, Adam. Sorry, sorry, buddy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Didn't even know. You're <laughs> always on. You're always the hand has been up there for about ten minutes now. So I'm sorry. You're, I'm you're just, always. I was in my wondering, office. is this thing visible? No, it is. <laughs> is this it thing is. on? Sorry. I'm very sorry. I'm not used to actually uh, having you come in no, and ask or, or uh, go. Right. Okay. So I was just wondering. Um, I think just about every OS has one of these, uh, a disk usage analysis. So this is uh, just the one on my computer, which is Linux. But you pop it open. It'll do a scan of uh, your your folder or something. Here's just a scan of my home folder, and it'll tell me where all of my disks. Oh, okay, I don't have much in um, in um, uh, in downloads, but this big chunk is my Dropbox. Okay, Dropbox is where all the action's happening. I can click on that, and it can tell me visually with the biggest chunk. That's where that's where all of my my stuff is. And they can say, well, what's this big chunk? Uh, what's this big chunk over here? Oh, this is Sysbox. So this is more more work stuff for my um, island. It says, okay, what's that big chunk? Why is this big chunk taking up so much of my space? And oh, there's some course backups in there. Okay, now I know where my folders, uh, where my space is being taken up quickly and um, easily. So I'm I'm wondering. I'm thinking there's there's got to be something like this for the Mac as well. Jose, can you speak to that one? Something like this that tells you where your file space is actually gone. Right, okay. Uh, let, me, let me show you the equivalent. I'm gonna the cancel that your... stop share button. Yeah, it's okay, I got it. Okay, okay I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you the equivalent on the Macintosh, okay? <laughs> this is my 32 terabyte hard disk, which is only taking up a little bit of space. This is the equivalent we have on the Macintosh. <laughs> it is not separated in little chunks. It's not you know circular and shows you a very nice visual array of where stuff is. It just says, this is how much you're using. Actually, Jose, there's a second one. Where is it? Where is it? If you go up to the uh, the Apple symbol in the top left corner, mm -hmm. and then you go to about this Mac. Keep going. Then you go to storage. All righty. Thank you. Okay. So but that tabulate everything that's on your drive and color code what, the, uh, what they are. Mm. Okay. So let me show you that one. Thank you. See, I didn't even know that. Um, this stuff moves around. And... Uh, but where I, I kind of like to point out is that um, it'll tabulate and it'll make it very quick, but it, Apple's philosophy, very different from Linux because Linux and, and Unix knows that it's working with pretty much expert users. Anybody who uses Unix or Linux has probably graduated from Windows and, and Apple and wants to know more about the computer, wants more control of their computer. Now, there you see it. See how much less information and how much less detail information you get. And this isn't something that's something that the normal person will find because Apple actually thinks that they're protecting you from seeing all this stuff and worrying about all this stuff. Whereas Linux knows that it's dealing with expert users and wants to show this stuff and they wanna make it easy to use. And sometimes you can agree with that philosophy that Apple's using, sometimes you can disagree with it. I would actually like to have something like, um, like um, uh, Adam has. But then again, some people might look at that and go, oh my God, that's so confusing and might actually turn them off looking into their computer further. But to show you, Adam, that is where it is. It used to be in different places. It used to be where I first showed it under disk utility, but it doesn't show it as much anymore. So thank you, Scott, for, for pointing that out to me. And saving and a little time too, if you hit the manage button, it will actually show you uh, further details. Oh, really? Okay, so hang on. 
Okay. So there you go. Oh, uh, you want to, or I don't know, Scott, did you want to take over and show this from your end? Uh, it's probably easier if you talk about it from your share than from mine. Oh, that's okay. If you just hit the manage button, it, it'll show you everything. Yeah, you I need. think he hit it, but the share is not oh, sharing that. I'm you know, sorry, you're right. It popped into um, into a different window. So I thought mm -hmm. you were seeing it. Yeah, it popped into this window. There you go. Staying on the other window, but um, this window will pop up in front of your computer. So right there on the left side, you see everything pretty granularly as to what's taking up your space. Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of stuff here. And for instance, you, you can just click on any one of those files and then just hit delete. And you've immediately just made some space. Uh, my gel 2020 presentation. Should I delete that? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, be careful. Like, uh, you know, the, this stuff does uh, take some permanence, but it just puts it in the trash. And I was actually going to talk a little bit about that, about, you know, a lot of people forget to empty their trash. Hmm. Yeah. And if you just drop like a couple of gigabytes of files in there, and then uh, because you're making a lot of, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later too, the files that you make, the file types and the file, um, like the, uh, the resolution of the, uh, the movies that you make, all of that stuff really affects your disk space. In case in point, I could just see that you've got 32 gigabytes of stuff in your trash. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, Adam, how much time do we have left uh, for this presentation? Actually, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think we're going until 1030, aren't we? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, and by the way, I forgot to answer this question. Uh, you might have seen that my disk name is Emmy Lou. And someone did ask, why do you call your disk Emmy Lou? Mm. Uh, I, uh, I have been naming traditionally all of my hard disks after all of my favorite musical artists. So uh, I started running out of things like Bruce Coburn and Van Morrison and Bruce Springsteen. And I, and I would call that Van and Bruce and Red Ryder and stuff. And now I'm down to Emmy Lou Harris. <laughs> because I've, been, I've been going through a lot of discs in my life. Um, before we move on to the next topic, anybody else want to comment or question what, what uh, Scott and I have so far been talking about? Is anybody else watching the chat? Because some, whoa, 35 new messages. Holy crap. Um, if anybody watching the chat that might want to uh, say that, hey, this was being discussed, Scott, this is being discussed. Hey, Jose. Yeah, I made a comment up in the chat. It's kind of disappeared now up in the in the ether. But it says, how do you feel about using paid services like Clean My Mac for helping you purge some of these unneeded files or clean up the system? Are these um, really worth it? Um, I'm asking from the standpoint of someone who has actually purchased. Yeah, so you're not <laughs> asking for a friend. You're, you're asking. Yeah, I'm friend. asking for myself. I actually did purchase it. Um, even though I know how to look for these files and purge them, um, the marketing was really good and it made me feel like there was other stuff that I probably wasn't seeing that I could and that my system needed to be cleaned up because I was having some performance issues. So um, what is your feeling in general about these types of paid apps that you can subscribe to or download? Let me go first on that one because my answer is going to be fairly short. Um, I've never used those apps because I knew that if I start using something that I might start to get lazy and and start to let my file organization start to go by the wayside because, oh, I can look for it later. And I always kept to disciplining myself by saying, don't let your general folder get too big. Keep your folders um, organized over time because, you know, OTJ became important to me and started taking up a lot more disk space, of course, only for the last 18 months. So that's the way I organize it. Now, there might be stuff that I will not notice and, and maybe that paid surface service will be able to find it for me better. But me personally, I, how much was it, uh, Susan, what you paid for whatever service you got? I purchased it for use on four different devices because I hooked all of my family up as well. And I think it was something like, uh, it was 50 to $80 maybe for a year subscription. Mm. Yeah. See, I'm a cheapskate and I would never pay that, <laughs> but that's because I'm a cheapskate. That doesn't say anything about the, the, the quality of the, uh, the software. Also too, whatever I can say about software like that would be from 1995 or so when it was the last time I even thought about it, but Scott might know a lot more about it because, you know, he, he ran the shop and stuff. What do you think, Scott? Yeah. I, I've used clean my Mac. Um, it, it, I, I hate to say it, it, it pretty much does exactly what we just did, where we just went <laughs> to the, the Apple up in the top left corner. Uh, we asked it to tell us what's on our hard drive and where it is and how much space it uses. I, Clean My Mac does one extra step and that what they promise that they can do is that they can go into caches and hidden places that you don't know that you're expanding, you know, things that are building up over time that you don't know, you know, what's in there. 
And so uh, Clean My Mac can potentially clean out some browser temp files or uh, for instance, let's just say you use you, you installed GarageBand once and you stopped using it and you didn't realize that you had gigabytes of musical instruments uh, loaded into a hidden directory that you don't know how to get rid of. And that that's where Clean My Mac could potentially uh, help. But once again, the, if you just go to the simple Apple in the top left corner, uh, you'll, you'll achieve the same goal. Like you can do all the same cleaning that you could use with Clean My Mac. Now, the advantage Clean My Mac may offer is that it will offer to do this every day. And so then it, it can scan your computer, find a file, say, look, I, I did a great job, look at me and then go away. Um, and so I $50, think- dollars please. <laughs> exactly, I, I mean, I, I hesitate because I, I think it, it does an okay job, but do I need to pay for it? I'm not confident that I do. But um, and this is a good question though, because there are many of these programs available for yeah. Windows as well. And uh, I, you know, if, if, if the whole thing is kind of overwhelming, you know, and then maybe one of these programs can help, but just be aware that they're over promising to get your dollars. Marketing. Um, yeah. Before we go to Eukarya's question, um, it reminded me of another point, even more uh, so that I don't want to spend money on um, Clean My Mac and, and those sort of file organization pieces of software. Personally, from my, my own standpoint, I would hesitate even more to pay for virus checkers. Hmm. Virus checkers are pretty much worthless. So when they say, oh, we'll protect your Mac against this and this and that, no, no, they're not. Because virus checkers are built upon the ability for the virus company to send a file somehow to the virus checker on your computer and says, look for these telltale signs of activity. But most really dangerous viruses are what are called zero day attacks. And they start right on that day. And there's no way that that file, which the software received maybe, if at all, 24 hours ago, can stop that attack because that virus's activity is not in that downloaded file. Now, if the virus company is really on the ball, they'll get that in there, send it up to a forced upload and get the, the virus checker to do it, but it might be too late. So virus checkers are even less, uh, but I don't know, Adam, what do you think about that kind of advice? And uh, Scott, what do you think about that kind of advice? Virus checkers, no need. Uh... I would have to say no need. I mean, okay. for instance, there are still files that are that are you know being passed around in your email that are a zip file that you know may still contain a, a virus that's outdated but still a virus, right? It, it so having a, a simple or a basic trustworthy. This is the difficult part: is that there are enough virus antivirus programs out there that it actually is difficult to determine which one is trustworthy and which one isn't because there's a lot of no-name products. And their way of getting name is sometimes is to say, oh, I do all these great things. And, and they, they want the same amount of money as the trustworthy ones. And so it's, it's really difficult to determine which, which is a company I should trust and which one isn't. That's a um, good point. But just having a real basic one on your computer, like for instance, uh, malware bytes is a good one. Um, or, you know, find an alternative that you may sort of say, look, my friends have used this one. It's, it's found some results. Um, may help you in case you did get a minor virus infection. Yeah, and you're right, Scott. Um, I, I, you're right to have corrected me. The, the 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 aspect of viruses you have to watch out for is the social engineering aspect, where you say, "Hey, you know, you forgot this parcel uh, from the Royal Mail. Can you click here so then we can arrange a time for you to pick it up?" Social engineering. Yeah. That's where those old style viruses come in because, oh, okay, Royal Mail. What did I order? Boom! You got a virus on your computer, and um, and if you don't have that uh, virus checker, they, you're more liable to it. Me, I sort of know to watch for those social engineering phishing attacks. Adam, do you want to chime in yeah. before we go to Ukraine? On the uh, yeah, very quickly because I know Ukraine has been waiting, and I feel bad Sorry. about that. But uh, I, I I know that uh, viruses. You might say, you know, well, Macs can't really get them, and so well, Macs do have viruses and ransomware, mm -hmm. and uh, this is actually becoming increasingly a, a massive issue. But beyond that, do you work in an entirely Mac only populated environment? Are all of your colleagues only ever using Mac products, Apple products? Mm -hmm. Or do you sometimes share an email with a file with somebody in your family, your friends, your work life, anywhere on the planet who uses Windows, right? 
part of the reason why people are getting vaccinated is not to save themselves necessarily, but to create that herd immunity. And the viruses that are on our computers are actually a similar sort of thing. If you can have a virus scanner on your machine, you're not just protecting yourself, you're protecting the rest of the world as well. You're protecting your friends, your family, and your work colleagues. And that makes it worth it. Um, as Scott has uh, pointed out quite well, there are some nefarious ones. There are some bad ones. So definitely make sure that you are Installing a virus scanner thing that I mean, sometimes the virus scams the tricks are the tricksters are actually pretending to be virus scanning software. So make sure you get a good one. Um, uh, malware bytes, uh, I think so. Yeah, um, Sophos is uh, one that actually is very they've got a really good public outreach program, so you know that they're going to be trustworthy. Um, some of the other the ones that are uh, big names are also good, but. It's not just to protect yourself, it's to protect everyone around you. So I'm on Linux. So primarily we don't get a lot of the viruses because we're not being targeted. Um, but hey, if my server, if, if the OTJ site has on it a, a, an infected file, that's a really big problem for everyone who's visiting that site. And so in order to protect everyone else, we have to protect, uh, you know, have good hygiene for ourselves as well. So anyway, um, that's why it's never pointless to have a virus scanner. And also one last thing, it's just one line of defense. So just don't think that just because you've got your virus scanner in place, oh, I don't, I don't have to worry anymore. The virus scanner will save me. It won't all the time. It's, um, it's like wearing a hat when you go out into the sun. You still don't want to stay in the sun for 12 hours straight. Right, I so, changed my mind. I think I'll go get a virus scanner. Uh, you carry it. <laughs> you carry it. Hi. Um, just listening to everyone, it, it kind of set off a few things. Um, as a Mac user, I would, uh, and I came from a department of computer sciences, um, ESET is, the, it's a bit spendy, but it's possibly the best um, antivirus for Mac users. Um, Did you put that in chat? If you haven't yet, you can. Uh, yeah, it's that easy. <laughs> um, ESET. Um, I would stay away from McAfee. Or uh -huh. Mac oh, yeah. <laughs> Heard about and, that. <laughs> yeah, and North to, like, yeah, just to... don't bring them into your lives. Yeah. Um, uh the other thing i need to apologize i have to leg out of here in about five minutes um jose can i ask you to show us how to clean our cache and browser histories and like how to get rid of like web stuff because that i i found that very useful a few years ago um and the third thing i have a question for that may be like it's 15 years out of date. I went to um, like a media conference a few years ago and the guy kind of imparted to me, like keep nothing on your desktop because it's going to take up a load of space. But he said, um, if you have a folder and call it desktop, it's not going to take a lot of space, which I did not find logical then or now. Um, and Scott is now laughing himself, silly. So am I, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So basically what I'm asking is, is it wise to just put everything straight into documents? Uh, um, uh, Scott, you want to go first? I go first all the time. You want to go first? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll do, I'll and, do and, your brief. And You can laugh. <laughs> You put the things on your desktop that you really want to find quickly. That's that's the point. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But anything that you think you're not going to use and you, you don't desperately need right now, make sure to put it into one of your documents folders where you think it's appropriate. You know, I mean, make the make the hierarchy. I mean, add as many folders as you feel you need, you know, but make them as simple as you can. Right. This one's for my reading materials. This one's for my work stuff. This is for my family, you know, and then within that, you can put more folders underneath. But I mean, at least give yourself about five or six folders in your documents to quickly fold, you know, put things away and then keep the things on your desktop you think I need tomorrow. Those folders basically take up an insignificant amount of space. Okay. Almost, well, almost zero, 
Like, I, I think it's like, you know, when, less than a K and that's for the entire folder itself telling you where the folders are. So don't worry about making a lot of folders. Now, your request, uh, I haven't done this in a while, I gotta admit, uh, but, um, oh geez, no, I wanna show you the menu. Uh, you're not gonna see it from there. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to do this a little bit differently. Go to advanced. Okay, here. and you know, screen. thank you. Screen. No, no problem. Uh, no, it's not gonna grab that, okay. Um, let me try this from, um, I don't normally share to show my menu. So let me try my desktop. Can you guys actually see these pop-up windows? Nope, you can't see. Can you see these pop-up windows from the menu? You can, okay. Yes. So let me go to um, uh, the browser. Scott, you might want to help me out here because I haven't done this in a while. Um, then go to the browser and you'll see that the, my browser is Safari and it'll indicate that it's Safari. So if you can't find a particular menu that people are saying, well, now look for this, make sure that you're actually in the right application, that the window is frontmost. Now, <clears throat> uh, when was the last time I did this? Um, was it develop? Now, I don't want to do that because most people don't have the develop menu. Scott, do you remember where we clear caches? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, just, go to the, just go to Safari menu. Like the, okay. Thank uh, you. There, there you go. And then go to preferences there. Yeah, thought so. And now I have to switch the window. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Yeah. And then you can go to manage website data. Okay, manage website data. Where is that? Right, right in the middle of your screen there. Right in the, oh, there it is. <laughs> it's a button. Okay, manage website data. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and I don't know if you can see that partially, but it's um, it's a scrollable window. Can you see that scrollable window on top? Okay, and uh, okay, Scott, keep going. So this is showing you the, the cookies that all the different websites you go to where they go. And so these are the things that if you, okay, now be aware, cookies always, we, we play them up in, in space as being like these terrible things, you know, like I don't want my, my personal information being recorded. And so these cookies are bad. But in reality, many of what this is, is this is your login. So for instance, if you go to a certain website where you log into that website, this is exactly what that is. And so if you delete that, the next time you go to that website, that place that you've forgotten your password to get into, you won't be able to get in because of course, this is where your password was saved. But you may go to lots of websites where you don't record any passwords whatsoever. And so feel free to get rid of all of these because what this is, is that it remembers what you did on the website last time you were there. So for instance, let's just say you're a sports, guy and you go to a sports website and you indicate that you like a particular type of sport and you like a particular team, this is where that information gets stored. And so that the next time you go to the website, it'll say, oh, I see that you want to go watch the you know, Los Angeles Dodgers. And so you know, it tries to give you information focused on Los Angeles and, and the Dodgers without you having to indicate that because it already has that information in this cookie. But if you remove the cookie, then the next time it'll show you the uh, Australian rules football. And, uh, and I closed my window because I realized that after A uh, is a cookie for a website for assholes.com, which <laughs> I am a charter member of. And I didn't want to show you that actually I, I, I go there. Now, there, um, was, there was one more thing that when you were in that menu, there, if you click, I'm sorry, if you click on that menu for Safari one more time, there, it also yeah. says um, clear my internet history. And if you click on that, then um, I'm sorry, if you go uh, out of this menu, hit the, okay. the red, red button on the left. Just so people can follow us. So in the uh, Safari browser. Yeah, keep going. Go to the Safari menu. Yep, got it. And then in the middle of that menu, you can see clear website data. Okay, then you're gonna need to see that from or the desktop. Clear internet history, I think it was. Okay, no, it's, um. sorry, sorry, that's Zoom now. Uh, Safari, okay, clear history. There you go. Okay, and now here's another visual cue. When you see those three dots after a menu item, okay, that means that you're going to go another step. You're going to get another dialog box, okay? So if, if you think that, oh, clear history, that's it, and then you walk away from your computer and then something else happens, depending on the dialog box, the dialog box might go behind another window. So those visual cues are important. That little three dot, that means there's another step or another dialog box that you have to go through. Now, you guys can probably see this, but that's that little dialog box right there. Clear the last half hour, uh, clear today, yesterday, all history. Okay. That's uh, and then you know, typical cancel and clear history buttons. Mm. Okay. There you go. Uh, let's see. 
before we go, I wanted to show just a couple of other things uh, for people who have iPhones on their Macs and stuff, because there are a couple places where you can actually save a little bit of space if it's uh, not as important to you as it might be uh, for some of the things that you do. So for example, um, if I go to my iPhone, okay, and um, I just come back here quickly, you go to your, your basic iPhone uh, interface in your settings, okay, which is this one right here. Okay, and I got to click off because now it's it's gone to its um, uh, homepage menu editing. In settings, okay, you're going to come up to the front most window in settings. And here you can control the, I, now, uh, this does relate to your computer, okay, but it also relates to your iPhone. A lot of people end up buying iPhones with as much memory as they possibly can, 256 gigabytes. The new one is going to be up to like half a terabyte because they want all that memory for music and for videos and stuff. And, and before I know it, all of my memory is gone. And that's why I need to spend all of this extra money for memory. As Eric says, Apple makes you pay through the nose for memory, but there are a lot of ways that you can manage this memory. So it's, it's not as bad for it. Scroll down and you're going to find, okay, that every application has its own controls. And in the lower category are, are some of Apple's own basic applications. You look here where it says camera, everybody see that down around the top of the lower third camera, okay? Click camera, and you're gonna get the controls for the camera. Now look at that second setting. It records video at 1080p. Now, 1080p is basically what we know as 2K. And I have a 4K TV. It's beautiful resolution. And I think the new iPhones will record at 4K, which will say something like, um, uh, I think a 2160, yeah, 2160p. So it'll say 2160p, that'll record at 4K. This is a recording at 2K. Only just five years ago, this is the highest quality recording that even the best video recorders couldn't do. It's an amazing feature on an iPhone, but it takes up a huge amount of space. Now, to go from 1080p down to 720p, for most purposes, will not give you a huge visible difference but it will be one quarter the size of the video. So if you think that, well, 1080p is nice, but I'm not doing professional video, not this week. Next week, I actually want to use the iPhone for a certain purpose. Remember this control, because if you go 1080p at 30 frames, that's, a, and you go 60 frames, 60 frames is twice the size, which means that now it's eight times the size of 720p at 30 frames per second, okay? And I forgot, I can do 4K. Right. If I went 4K, my my uh, my 64 gigabytes would be sucked up pretty darn fast. So when my students hand in walking videos to me, this is one of the first things I show them. I don't know about your Android computers, or sorry, your Android phones, but if you can get this down here, okay, that will reduce your file size to one quarter, and it will gi give you room for many more videos and selfie videos with your friends. Okay, that's just one thing. Okay. But watch out for your file sizes. I think Scott wanted to talk a bit about that with photos and stuff like that too. But that's just one example, right? Yeah, and that's a great example. In fact, uh, right there in the middle of your screen as you were highlighting that, it actually gave you a, a breakdown of the different formats you choose and how much space they take. So you have to, you know, that's a great, great point that you made there, Jose, that, you know, if you're not intending to make this into a Hollywood movie or into something more professional, uh, there's really not a, a big advantage to you to, to go for 4K. I mean, as much as 4K is a, is maybe a, a great television experience, it, it is not a great experience for you to re be recording everything that you've done in your whole life in 4K, <laughs> because you will absolutely run out of hard drive space for the most minor of, of reasons. Yep, 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 yep. Um... Did you, uh, I, I, have you already talked about photos and music, Scott, about uh, controlling and watching those uh, file sizes bloom out of control or anything? I think you wanted to talk about that, no? Well, you know, I, I think that photos and, and movies and uh, music are gonna be the three most out of control things that you have on your, your computer that use up your space rapidly, you know? And, and it, it's, it's going to be a, there's going to be a few different types of people who probably, you know, really have that issue. One are going to be people who have taken their whole video library and ripped them into files and they've got a gigantic movie collection. And that's just a known problem, right? You're just going to have a ton of large movie files that, you know, it becomes just a big block on your hard drive. And so, you know, for those people, they're going to want to try and take that off of their computer and put that onto a, an external hard drive of some sort. Um, 
for those people who are uh, using Zoom a lot, then that that's one of those things that gets out of control really quickly. And you'll need to go into your Zoom settings and say, look, I, I don't need to record every session. Or if I do, maybe I want audio only, or maybe you do want the video file with audio. And so then you can determine, maybe I want to save them into a cloud location rather than putting it directly onto my hard drive. And that immediately will save you, you know, because you may be doing Zoom sessions every week, multiple of them. So your, your Zoom sessions will easily take up your hard drive. Mm -hmm. um, photos, you know, that's, that's a simple one. You go through your picture library. Sometimes, you, you, you know, you can just toss away pictures that you know you don't want anyway. They're just, they're blurry or, you know, the, you know good reasons to just do some maintenance in your photo library. But you, you, you could potentially take that photo library and put it onto an external drive as well. And then you no longer have to have it on your internal drive. That's right. And um, you can do that with your music library. It's kind of convoluted because- Yeah, the, that's complicated. I don't it's, know it's if complicated. I recommend that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't recommend it. I'm, I'm just saying you can because I do, uh, yes. but that's a convoluted process and I don't recommend it. Uh, Scott wouldn't recommend it. you can, but once you get to know a lot of these processes, there are a lot of things that you can do so that then you don't take up that two terabytes of you know premium hard disk space and start moving stuff to, uh, to less expensive backups. Now, Speaking of backups, now this isn't exactly about um, saving disk space, but um, last 2019 October, my entire hard disk collection crashed. Mm. My main disk crashed, my backup crashed, and because I was panicked and stupid and sleepy trying to figure this out at three in the morning, I screwed up my tertiary backup. Mm. My entire photo collection, all of my CDs that had been ripped were gone. I had to redo everything. I had lost files. I had to explain to work that I'm sorry, I need to have that file again. Uh, so I have lived with the pain of, of losing my entire disk. Last year, before that, I would lose backups. I want an honest assessment here. Who here has a reliable backup program? Raise your hands in uh, the participants list. Well, of course not. Good. Okay. I do not see a lot of hands up. <laughs> you got to get this done. You have got to do this. You do not want to experience what I did uh, just before the pandemic. I mean, pandemic was bad enough, but then I'm going, hey, where was that file? I need to do that for online teaching. And on the Macintosh, it is so easy. You just have to go out and get an external disk. Okay. Let's get but is that reliable? What is what reliable? Is Linda? Time Machine reliable? If I hadn't been such an idiot, yes. <laughs> because <laughs> I've used Time Machine for years and every once in a while the backup fails. There are a lot of factors at play. Uh, hmm. The quality of the disks that you purchased, the, uh, the quality of, um, of the timing that you set, although that timing should be automatic. But when you say fails, that's a very broad sort of uh, definition. What do you mean by fail, Linda? Well, the, um, I get an error message that it can't back up and I have to erase my backup and start over. Okay. Oh, Scott, go. Yeah, all right. Well, okay, so to keep in mind, there, there are two competing technologies of which one is the clear winner, but it's more expensive. Okay, so the, I walked into the Joshin Denki just yesterday and you know I could buy myself a two terabyte backup hard drive for Ichiman Nissan N. Okay. And I'm kind of thinking, well, that seems a little cheap for two terabytes, but it's because it's a spinning hard drive. Okay. And spinning hard drives are absolutely higher failure rate, hands down. There is absolutely no competition in this ball game. That's why one solid state drive technology is continuing to become the only you know, technology we'll be using in the future, but spinning hard drives still exist and they're cheap. Okay. So for instance, you could have gone in and gotten yourself it doesn't kind of matter what brand it is there's only two hard drive companies in the entire world now it's western digital and seagate and they make spinning hard drives for lots of different companies that are sold as toshiba drives or a data or there's lots of different names that go on them but it's still western digital and seagate that makes the drive and these drives just have a high rate of failure and the real problem that you have is that even if you were extremely delicate with them and kept them in the in the in the desk drawer like like i do and i'm I just kind of barely touch the things i don't i don't want any reason to make it go bad they will go bad okay but in worst case scenario they do get bumped they do get dropped there is a much higher rate of failure because of physical damage um, to these types of drives 
Now, so that's spinning hard drives. Solid state technology is the sort of stuff that's gone into these, but don't equate this with the solid state drive. Okay, so this is more reliable than a spinning hard drive, but it's cheap, cheap quality, cheap testing, cheap manufacturing. So this is still a little bit more reliable than a spinning hard drive, but not quite as reliable as the stuff that's inside the computer. So the, the, the solid state drive that you can buy either inside your computer or that you could buy at the Denki um, is going to be far more likely to survive physical damage, uh, doesn't have the high failure rate, and has a, is much, much quicker. When you purchased, uh, Susan, what do you got? What is this? Is this a spinning one or is this probably, a safe one? Probably it's a spinning one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and by the way, don't like flick it around like that. <laughs> really? Gentle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, be very Re gentle with them. Is yeah. this oh. why my first two failed and this is my third one and it has this number three sticker on it? Could very be. Very likely. So yes. when people say that, oh, my drive failed, and then I ask them, well, how did you treat it? <laughs> oh, you know, I just throw it in my bag with my computer because I need the files on it. <gasps> <laughs> so this is why you need primary backups, okay? And you need secondary and you need tertiary backups because as Scott was saying, you're going to experience a failure at some time and you're going to be tempted by the fact that they're cheaper. But if you put your primary filing system, not your primary backup, your primary filing system, like when Eric was saying, yeah, but you know, hard disks are cheaper. That's true. But you have got to be gentle with that thing. Don't toss it around. Don't bounce it around. Don't, if you drop it, doubt the integrity of that disk mm -hmm. and wipe it. And, and maybe if you think that I've got some really important data on there, maybe think about segregating that to tertiary backup and getting um, a new uh, um, uh, either spinning disk or a solid state stick. I, if, I, if I may though, and Adam and Scott can correct me on this, they do have a higher rate of failure, okay? But there is a, a statistic called the mean time between failures, which is called the MTBF. And the MTBF of a good Seagate disk is something around 25,000 hours. Okay. 25,000 hours works out to about 1,000 days. So that isn't really good because most of us hang on to our disks fairly well. But if you can find an MTBF of double or triple that, you're going to pay a lot of money for it. But remember that these ratings, it's, it's not like you know they're going to go bad in six months. And, um, and meet time between failures is 25,000 hours on. If you turn it on and off, okay? Now the on and off thing also isn't good for your disk, but if you only turn on the backup to do a backup, you've only used up half an hour of the MTBF rating. And it's got 50 more hours until the average point that the average disk fails. It could have a lemon and it'll fail in 20,000 hours. But this is, you know, like a, your mileage may vary about when your car is going to need a, transmix, a transmission repair, right? Adam. Um, quick comment on uh, those things, a few of these things that have been mentioned. Um, about the disk that you held up just before and uh, sort of, you know, oh, don't drop it and things like that. No, don't worry, this one's um, just... <laughs> but anyway, uh, this disk actually, when, when a disk is powered down, its heads will actually slide off the disk platter into a parked position. As long as it's parked correctly, it's fairly resilient against a bit of vibration, a bit of shaking and things like that. I mean, don't go nuts and don't, don't do stuff like this and, and bang it. Um, that, that's really bad. Don't do that. It. Don't even do but, that. <laughs> um, but you know, compared to when it's spinned up, when it's powered on and spinning up, the amount of damage that can be done is just completely, completely different, different worlds. Uh -oh. So making sure that it's fully powered down and that it's spun down and you, you know, you put your finger on it, you can't feel a vibration. That's when you know that, okay, this is probably actually safe to move. You I know was, while it's spun up, you're really asking for a world of hurt. I was just um, a little bit worried because I saw that the cable was in and I wasn't quite sure it was running or not. And if I saw the cable was in, I thought that might be running. Okay, could you gently put that down again? Uh, I, I caught a glimpse of the other end of that cable. So I figured... One end was plugged into the drive, but the other end wasn't, right? So, okay, so I don't um, know, but look, yeah. just but anyway, generally... it's 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 just to be just to be a, a bit cautious with them, when, especially when they're spun up, um, because sometimes you'll you'll have people who oh it's spun up, but oh, I'm just going to move it over here and things like that. I know it's a pain, 
But what you really want to be doing is stopping it, un you know, ejecting it, waiting for it to go down, then move it. So let those, those drive heads park so that they're not hovering above the, the platters where they can scratch them because they're only like half a hydrogen atom away from the surface of the platter. So the tiniest little vibration can actually make an impact on that thing. And that's going around at 7,200 RPM. So um, power it down before you move it is Got the it. big thing. Okay. Next issue. Um, Got uh, it. Ooh, go. Last thing, backup wise, um, MTBF, totally on board with that. Uh, also, so I use a 16 terabyte external hard disk and I back up, say, you know, um, intermittently. I don't actually keep it connected all the time. This recently, before what I was saying about uh, ransomware, has an additional benefit in that chances are that if the ransomware gets into you, um, it's going to be while your disk is switched off. And so that backup is not connected to your computer when your computer got the ransomware on it. Um, so full backup of all of your data on a disk every now and again, so that if you actually do lose the data on your computer, it's not connected and it's not corrupted at the same time as the rest of your data. So, because it, it really sucks twice as bad if your backup is also corrupted. <laughs> so, ain't that the truth? Have we frightened you all yet? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about something else. Um, anybody with an, another another topic that they want to discuss about uh, this general file management? Uh, uh, if not, I'll I'll have another tip about um, controlling the size of um, your music again on your phone, Susan. Sorry, just to follow up on what you were just talking about, I just put it in the chat. So what are we? What am I supposed to be backing up on if this spinny disk one that was reasonably priced is not really that safe or stable. You recommend that USB thumb yeah, like, drive looking thing? Yeah, there's flash drives, but uh, also, and this is the more reliable option. When you go to the Dinky and you look at your options for external storage, you're gonna see a smaller backup hard drive that actually is not a spinning drive. It's made of the solid state technology that goes inside of our laptops now or inside of uh -huh. our, our phones. And you're going to tell, uh -huh. you're going to see the physical difference because it will be a smaller drive and it will be a higher price. <clears throat> and so then you'll know that's a solid state drive that I can most likely trust and real advantage when you're transferring a lot of files, it's faster. Yeah, uh, Michiko, Michiko just posted too, what's it called in Japanese? Should we be looking for SSD then SSD. on the package? SSD. Yes, yes. In Japanese, okay. it's called SSD. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. But if I have a moment or two, I'll can, see if I can find you something uh, on Amazon and, and point you guys towards the general direction of what you have to look for. Yep. Can I just jump in there also? Um, Eric. You, you, if you're going for that expensive one, you really might want to think about your uh, cloud because mm -hmm. the cloud, they're looking after your external hard drive for you and mm -hmm. it starts to become as cheap if not cheaper and safer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more available. So, um, oh, sorry, Eric keeps going. Okay. Yeah, Eric, yeah. yeah. just those, those ones that you're talking about, they are expensive <laughs> and uh, they eventually do run out. Whereas the cloud stuff, okay, it's, it's, it's probably gonna be a similar price and they're um, reset for you and you just keep paying you don't have to buy a new disc it's just already always done for you so if you're mm -hmm. going to go that expensive route probably the cloud is better i would suggest anyway so on that note uh, because i wanted to we should choose one choose cloud or the ss no no, no both. Don't, don't, both. don't just choose one choose both both no choose both. yeah, yeah. Well, if you had a if you had a primary backup a secondary backup a tertiary backup a quaternary backup you will not hurt yourself. This doesn't matter what you're not, you have the time to do it, to set it up. Uh, the, you're willing to pay the expense to get the cloud contract and stuff. Uh, speaking of the cloud contract, I was mentioning this to Isles, I forget his last name, but it was a different meeting. Um, he was asking on a different topic, but uh, my solution to it was, well, what about your Microsoft 365 account with the university? Do you have one? And he goes, yeah, I think I do. And unfortunately the breakout room cut off right there before I could tell him that if, you don't have one with a university, check with your university. Microsoft went on a tear and started making these MS365 accounts with a lot of different universities. And some universities allow their part-timers as well as their full-timers to have an account. 
And because I'm sorry, I'm a little bit prejudiced against Microsoft because of the 90s and what they tried to do to Apple uh, in the 90s, I was not that enamored with the idea of getting on to Microsoft and, and using their stuff. I still am not. I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint or, or anything else. But I found out that if you have an MS365 account, you more than likely have a free two terabyte OneDrive account that goes with it. That's right. Now, if you have not looked into that, you have free two terabytes for mm. the amount of time that you are working at that university, free two terabytes on the cloud, that whether you're on Windows or whether you're on Mac, if you set up the actual software on your computer, it will act as if it's just another folder, just another disk that's connected to your computer. If your computer is online to the internet, it has complete access to that two terabytes. That's right. So look into that. Find out if your university has an MS365 account that you can access. Check out OneDrive, O-N-E-D-R-I-V-E, one word. Take a look at it and find out. I, I, Scott, I don't think it gets lower than two terabytes, right? I think it gets uh, higher, but not lower. I don't know. It all comes down to cost, of course. Yeah. So, but I think that was a standard contract that Microsoft was trying to sell to a lot of universities. Oh, we'll give you PowerPoint. We'll give you Teams. We'll give you a word for all of your staff and two terabytes for all the staff. If you sign up for this, I don't know what it costs. And probably like a, a 500,000 yen a month or something like that. And, and it's great. I don't use the other stuff very much, but OneDrive, fantastic. Do you find think... one, excuse me, do you find OneDrive fast enough to access? Sure. I would use it as ordinary backup. I have like primary, secondary, and tertiary backup on my desk. And I use it mostly just to make sure that I have access between all of my devices uh, to certain things. But in terms of backup, I actually do the primary backup on other disks. But just saying that uh, if you don't, if you're not as stupid as I am in terms of spending your excess cash on, on computer goods, uh, you can use that two terabytes for a lot of different things. And yeah, you know, you gotta be maybe a little bit more patient if you have a weak internet connection, but generally it'll do. Yep. I mean, all the major cloud services, right? The, the Dropbox, the OneDrive, which is from Microsoft, the Google Cloud Drive, the uh, Apple iCloud, they're all available on all platforms, right? You can still use Apple iCloud on Windows. You know, you can use any of these services on all your devices. So you save it one place and then you can see it on everything. Next issue. And we have about 10 minutes left, but uh, um, actually, um, now I've forgotten. Do we have something back to back, Adam? I'm just going to check the calendar here. What's the next one? Uh, yes. Yeah, Cassie's up. I'm sorry, Cassie's at 10. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So we, we do have to keep it tight. So uh, next issue. Sorry, I'm just gonna ask a question. I put it in chat and no one was able to answer it. Um, how, what's a normal lifespan of a USB and a spinning hard disk? Like if I've had the USB for like five years, should I be backing it up or buying a new one just in case or same with the USB, or I mean the, uh, the spinning hard disk? Scott? Sure, um, okay, I've, I've had lots of people who've bought in cheap laptops that have spinning hard drives. Every cheap laptop has a spinning hard drive. Every cheap laptop, there is no exceptions. Um, if it's truly cheap, it has a spinning hard drive, unless it's like a Google uh, Chromebook or something. But so I've seen those hard drives fail in months, like could be practically brand new, like within you know just a week or so of buying it, it could be the, the hard drive has already failed. And I've seen it far too many times because I've had to replace the hard drives. Um, so I would, I would hesitate to put anything on a spinning hard drive ever. I, I hate them. I have seen them hundreds and hundreds of them fail. And I've replaced every single one of them, shaking my head, thinking how wasteful the whole thing is, especially because manufacturers don't always take them back when the hard drive has failed. So uh, yes, I would, I would hesitate to use a spinning hard drive for any, any reason. Um, you're right. If you've got a five-year-old flash drive, yes, I would consider replacing it because uh, they're not made from the highest tested, highest quality uh, solid state drive components. And, and when they fail, they fail badly. You lose everything most of the time. So you can't um, retrieve any more of your data from the flash, the USBs or the flash drives? Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. <laughs> That's right. And I don't like to play my chances on that. Yeah. Right. The, the best thing to do is to actually just to spread your backups across as many devices as you can. When I was really paranoid about it, I kept a copy of my disks at home. I kept a copy at work. 
Okay, mm -hmm. because you never know. It's not just the uh, the disk failure itself. If you have a house fire, mm -hmm. and if you had the uh, the actual um, wherewithal to think, well, what if I have a house fire? What if I have a flood? And yeah, I might lose a lot of other stuff, but it would be nice if I could at least have the photographs of my grandparents. And mm -hmm. you're doing that favor to yourself by keeping a copy in a separate physical location. Um, some people I know, especially like um, uh, industrial solutions, they keep them in fireproof safes. Mm -hmm. You never really know, right? And, and it doesn't hurt you if you can afford it, if you have the wherewithal and the, uh, the effort uh, is, is, is an okay expense for you. Yeah. More backups, the better. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the question you have to ask yourself is how valuable is the data that I have? Like, oh, it, it, maybe it's not that valuable, right? Like maybe it's, you know, I can always get another copy from a university share or, you know, from a friend or whatever else. But there are some things you really have no other way. Like once you've taken those family photos and you've digitized them and you have no physical photos of your family any longer, right? Like, you know, old generations of your family have been scanned and it's the only copy you have. That stuff's pretty valuable. And you have to ask yourself, how much would I, would I pay to recover that from a failed hard drive? And it could be thousands, right? But yeah. even, even thousands, right? You kind of think, well, maybe thousands is still worth it to me because it's, it's really important. But so if you can take a few moments of extra time and consideration to save those in a place that you feel pretty solid about, you, you've certainly saved yourself a, an awful lot of headache and heartache. It, I asked myself that question once after my 2019 crash, and I thought, what would I pay? What I, what I most hated losing was that I'm a, I'm, I am, believe it or not, I like to think of myself as a photographer. Mm -hmm. It's my hobby. I don't get paid for it, but I like going out and taking artistic creative photographs. And I had about 10 years of, uh, of um, hard work making what might, some people might say, well, that's not very good. You're never going to make money at this. And that's true. But they were very dear to me. And I asked myself, what would I pay? To get those photographs back and yeah it was i thought yeah you know probably need you my end i need you sanju you my end i don't know my, i'm not going to have that opportunity i can't think about it that clearly but yeah don't have that regret and just you keep your primary your secondary tertiary backups if you can afford it exactly okay uh gretchen so i have drive and dropbox and all the things can i just choose one and call it a day and just keep paying thank you sky that that's yeah. okay Good one. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, I, I find the iCloud to be the easiest if you're a Mac user because it's so well integrated with okay. everything that you're already doing. And it's just so easy to just save it into that folder and know it's already done. Okay. Can someone find a link for the SSD? Like a oh, good. That's right. I'm sorry. I just want to think about iCloud. It's going to come. So I'll be here and waiting for a link. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure that you get it. Just one thing about iCloud um, look into the Apple One service. Because it'll, it'll save you money if you've already got Apple Music and yes. Apple Cloud. And if you're thinking about, well, you know, that Apple TV, that sounds kind of fun. If you're thinking about it, instead of going straight to the 50 gigabyte service, which I think is like um, $10 a month, hmm. or I think something like $15 a month, you get 50 gigabytes, Apple Music, Apple TV. If we were in America, you'd also get Apple Fitness, all these other things. And I'm Apple just saying, yep. I'm sorry. Apple Arcade as well. Oh, Apple Arcade. So a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, I don't even be using it, but, you know, why rip yourself off? And uh, I know that I would go Apple One because I just want Apple TV and, um, and, uh, and iCloud if I did it. But right now, actually, I'm very happy with OneDrive. And I don't think I'll be leaving that university for at least a couple of years. Hmm. So check into that too, uh, Gretchen. You might save self some money there. And I will now hunt down that link before you go, uh, unless there's another question that we need to address. Scott, can you watch the room for just a second? Sure. Uh, SanDisk is a good brand if that helps any. If you wanted to look for a solid state drive, SanDisk is a, is a good, good path to go. Oh, now it's auto incorrect, trying to keep con uh, SSD two terabyte. Okay, so let me just uh, show you this real quick. In my way. They look like these, okay? And yep. you're gonna see that the prices are high. Yes. Well, what's your data worth? Okay, so, right. But they look like these, okay? These are SSDs, external two terabytes and such. And actually that's cheaper than I thought it would be at 35,000. I thought it'd be around 45, 50,000. And if you see them on sale, okay? 
uh, make sure it's a high quality one. Don't get don't get ripped off by something. Oh, this is a, an SSD that's just as good, and but you know it's got cheap cables, cheap terminals, and stuff like that. Stay mm -hmm. with a good name like SanDisk. Two uh, terabyte. I'm sorry. Two terabyte. I would suggest it's probably good for most of your uses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. You. Uh, you know, if you're going to keep this for five or six years, it, it never hurts to go a little bit beyond what you what you feel you need. Mm -hmm. And uh, Crucial is also a good brand. Uh, all these all these ones that you pulled up here, G G Tech, and and some of these yeah. are all. I have G Tech cool. spinning discs, and my G Tech spinning discs have been absolutely flawless since uh, 2010. Now, I'm kind of pushing the envelope. I'm not saying you should, but um, G-Disk is very good. SanDisk will never fail you. Uh, I have Toshiba in, uh, you know, industrial level drives in, in, a, in a really good uh, RAID array. Adam saw it. Adam, did you have any other recommendations besides what you're kind of showing around there? Uh, just the idea of um, sometimes what you can also do is get your SSD. Uh, well, this is actually a spinny disk, but um, a spinny disks also sort of work with this. But if you want to go SSD, you can actually get the 2.5 inch form factor, which is a often a lot cheaper. Uh, it's got a SATA connector, so it won't be as fast. But you can also get a cheap enclosure and stick that in there. And as long as the disk itself is actually pretty decent quality, the enclosures themselves are only something like 1,000 yen. Um, okay. So you can st stick it in there. It's the disc quality that's important, not yeah. the the connector so much. Yeah. Uh, um, but then you can plug it in, and that'll be a fair bit cheaper than other options. The uh, quick answer to Michiko Buffalo, as far as I know, is a reliable brand. But I've I uh, I haven't worked with their SSDs before. But generally, they make good stuff. So you want to ask about Buffalo. Um, we're running out of time, everybody. Uh, it is now 1030. I'm, I don't want to bite into uh, Cassie's time very much. But True. thank you very much. Uh, I think we got answered a lot of questions there. Um, uh, Scott, final last words? Uh, no, thanks for your time. It was really fun to uh, meet everybody. Yeah, it was fun to meet you too. Let's thanks give him a round of applause. Thank you, Scott and Jose. Thank you. Everyone who chipped in actually got a good team effort. Yep. And uh, if you want more advice on general life as an online teacher, hang around. Uh, one of the best uh, presentations that we had last year was uh, given by uh, Cassie, and she's about to give a, uh, a reprise of that. Cassie, you've got co-host right now. Did you want me to help you with the room? Um. Well, you can relax. Can you hear me? <laughs> we, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. I'm using a different microphone than usual like a fancy one um so I, if you can't hear me let me know oh you sound great um, i'm great awesome okay usually i'm just using my okay uh, Hang on. i just gotta kill this for